There we go, get myself off mute here. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the um, Food for Thought uh, panelist uh, discussion today, uh, sponsored by uh, Fair Start. I am Julene Smith, the Fair Start uh, board chair, and it's great to be with all of you today to moderate what is a very important discussion around a critical and timely topic, and that is equitable employment and economic mobility. Now, before we get started, I'd like to help to center our work and conversation. And I want to begin by acknowledging that we are on the sacred lands of the First Peoples of Seattle, the Coast Salish peoples, and specifically on the land of the First Peoples of uh, Seattle, the Duwamish tribe. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish people who have stewarded past and present. And I want to thank all of you so much for being with us today. Um, we all know that the pandemic has led to millions of people across the country losing their jobs, with the lowest wage earners uh, being hit the hardest. The level of job loss is on par with what was experienced during the Great Depression. And women and individuals who identify as Black, Indigenous, and people of color, the BIPOC community, have been hit especially hard. So as we uh, start to recover and think about a post-pandemic world, we have an opportunity to build it back better, uh, particularly for the BIPOC communities and the people living with low incomes. Today, we're going to talk about equitable employment and economic mobility, hot topics, right? And so we thought we'd be uh, really prudent and define for you what we mean exactly by, uh, excuse me, equitable employment. Uh, what, is equitable, what is equitable employment? It is when racial income gaps have been eliminated and jobs provide a livable wage and pathway toward upward economic mobility. Let me say that again, that is important. Equitable employment is when racial income gaps have been eliminated and jobs provide a livable wage and pathway toward upward economic mobility. So to be clear, there are significant barriers and challenges to achieving equitable employment, including systemic racism, the benefits cliff, and the increasingly high cost of living in King County, just to name a few. Um, we're going to discuss some of these today. And there are really no fast or easy solutions. Uh, in many cases, we're learning and na navigating this road together. Many of us are early in our journeys around this work to help figure out the best pathway forward. And Fair Start is really grateful to work with organizations like the Workforce Development Council and to provide assess uh, assessment and benchmark growth, as well as our employer partners like MOD, who are learning and innovating alongside of us. We're all in this together and we are learning together. And we know that centering race equity is critical. We need to apply an equity lens to every strategy and aspects of our work. Even before COVID, many people in the BIPOC community and immigrant communities were in crisis and experiencing huge disparities in the workforce. So today we're going to also talk about how food service jobs can be a great starting point to learn new skills that can be leveraged to move up the economic ladder in other industries. But how can we help make the food and hospitality industries, which have been disseminated in, uh, by the pandemic, come back even better and more equitably? That's the question we want to ask ourselves. And while not specifically the focus of today's event, we have to acknowledge the recent allegations of sexual harassment by chefs right here in the Pacific Northwest. The restaurant industry as a whole has a problematic history of toxic behaviors that must change if the industry wants to truly create a safe, inclusive, and equitable environment for all. People must be heard and their issues must be addressed consistently and fairly. In short, enough is enough. 
So I'm looking forward to digging in more and introducing our panelists. But before I do, because this is such a hot topic, kind of a meaty topic, I thought it would be really helpful to just share a few statistics to give us a little bit of context with regards to the challenges that we are facing. 56% of the hospitality and food industry in Washington state was impacted by COVID, the hardest hit industry. More than 2,000 restaurants have permanently closed. And while there are still a lot of great food service employers, many are experiencing a labor shortage as they try to recover from the pandemic. In King County, in order for one adult with a preschooler at home, to be self-sufficient, meaning no private or public assistance. Now catch this, listen to this. They must make over $36 an hour. The Workforce Development Council has done some research to identify sectors of opportunity that are expected to recover well and offer economic mobility for workers. And these industries include warehousing, construction, transportation, manufacturing, retail trade, IT, and healthcare. So these are industries to watch. Now I'd love to, uh, for Marie, our guest today, Ali and Angela to introduce themselves and say a little bit about their respective organizations. So we're gonna, um, without further delay, begin to dive into this really hot topic for the day by having Marie introduce herself, followed by Ali and then Angela. So Marie, take it away. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. I'm Marie Carose. I'm the CEO of the Workforce Development Council of Seattle King County. And I was brought on two years ago to lead um, a major organizational transformation to really um, build the WBC's capacity, but also focus on equity and working to become a regional kind of convener uh, around with working both with industry as well as ensuring community voice is at the table and, and part of our, our design and co-designing our work. Thank you, Marie. And I go on or, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I wanted to say thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. And we look forward to hearing more from you. Um, Ali, uh, Mod Pizza, introduce yourself. Hi, and thank you. Um, I love being part of anything where the word, you know, learning and innovating um, is thrown out there. So um, thank you. It's sort of been the story of Mod, really. Um, my husband and I started Mod Pizza back in 2008. We um, mm. opened the very first location downtown Seattle. And it was really just a laboratory because at the time, fast casual pizza, the category did not really exist. So we had a lot of learning and a lot of innovating uh, to do. Um, and that theme continues. Uh, when we opened our first location, it coincided with um, the Great Recession, the onset of the recession, which arguably might not be an ideal time to start a business, um, but it was actually a great time to start a business for us because it forced us to ask some really tough questions and to look at our community and really ask what is needed. Um, we knew that fast casual pizza was needed because that just satisfied a, a, um, a very fundamental need that we had for hungry boys, that sort of thing. But Beyond that, what did the community need? And I think the community needed and continues to need um, people that are willing to do what they can to help other people. And the importance of business, um, believing and understanding and feeling the responsibility that they can and should be a force for good. So we applied that thinking to um, how we treated and thought about our customers, the price point, all toppings, one price, that sort of thing. But we also thought about it as it relates to being an employer. Um, how do we want to show up as an employer? And we went into it with a very open mind. We wanted to be a great employer. And um, we were very inspired by people very early on. By location number two, we had employed some incredible humans uh, that had been just as involved. And what was even more incredible was what they did with the, the opportunity of a job. And mm -hmm. that, that um, inspiration really helped form what is now um, you know, our, our purpose. Mod exists to serve people in order to contribute to a world that works for and includes everyone. 
And we've been building out our platform. Um, we have over 500 locations now all around the country, uh, over 10,000 members of our mod squad. Uh, but we do continue to um, feel that we are very much um, learning and innovating. And especially with regard to these topics and our ability to make positive impact through the platform of employment, we still have a lot of learning to do, uh, but we're very grateful for the partnerships that allow us to figure things out. So really, really feel very honored to be part of this conversation. That is so exciting, inspiring. Dare I say, you have purpose beyond profit for what you do every day. That's really, <laughs> really exciting. Thank you so much. Angela, um, would you like to please introduce yourself? Yes, thank you so much. Well, I'm Angela Dunleavy. I'm the CEO of Fair Start, coming up on my third year here. And I am so, have been so excited to be part of this panel. Um, I work closely with both Ali and Marie um, uh, working on, in partnership in a youth um, internship uh, with Mod Pizza for quite some years and just really admiring Mod as just a model employer and a model in the business community for how um, we really can be human-centered in our approach to employment. And working with Marie as a member of the Workforce Development um, Council Board, um, to really think about um, the role, and I think Marie does a really wonderful job of, when she says convener, she is really taking um, uh, business, nonprofits, and labor and bringing everyone together to center around individuals, individuals who have been displaced from work, and individuals who, uh, as in for youth, who might be in the, the school to prison pipeline. So at Fair Start, um, our mission is to um, transform lives, disrupt poverty, uh, and nourish communities through food, life skills, and job training. And it really does take partnerships uh, like those here on this, on this column and this panel to make that happen. So thank you um, everyone for joining in the audience and thank you Marie and Allie uh, for being the part of this conversation. And Julian, as always, thank you for being our fearless moderator. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So, all right, well, we're gonna go ahead and um, dive right in. And Marie, we'd like to start with you. Um, the Workforce Development Council has done considerable research and planning around advancing workforce equity in the Seattle King County area. Now we realize that this is a really big topic, but can you talk at a high level about some of the key barriers to equitable employment? Thank you. So oftentimes as we looked at, as you, you, you know, spoke to the pandemic really exacerbating and really laid bare all of the disparities, racial disparities, especially in, in employment and access. And as um, we took a deep dive and really looked to understand kind of where those barriers are, who's being impacted and, and based on data, but also just from, you know, community conversations and others, we knew that Prior to the pandemic, people saw our region as one of great prosperity. Mm. And we were being, you know, looked at nationally. But then if you drill down and you look at the data, you see that those people, many of people of color that, you know, come from the community weren't being, weren't sharing in that prosperity. So there's a great um, report by Brookings that looks at the hundred and the largest metropolitan areas where in growth and prosperity, 10th and 3rd, were really at the top nationally. Then when you come to inclusion and race, we drop significantly. So mm. um, we have a long ways to go. <clears throat> and, and you spoke to the cost of living, but it's also around the industries that are growing, as well as the job quality. As we've seen as we came back from the recession, while there was great growth, a lot of those jobs, job quality kind of deteriorated. A lot of the jobs that were coming back lacked benefits. They lacked, you know, um, living wages and as our our economy continues to grow sorry i'm trying to um if we don't address that we're not going to get back to an equitable recovery within certain industries we see occupational segregation it's not just about skills gap this is really about people's and their access to upward mobility and jobs so in healthcare, the restaurant industry and others those that have made it up the ladder and getting the better paying jobs are less diverse than those entry level or lower wage workers. Right. So we recognize that there are practices and and real systemic issues within industry as and as well as kind of our training process that exacerbate and we're not going to get to address those barriers unless we have 
partnerships with industry and we recognize it's not just skills, there are skills and partnership in looking at, at employer practices and industry practices, as well as our workforce development system practices and how we exacerbate or re reinforce some of those disparities. Mm, that's interesting. Um, Angela, um, with uh, that being kind of the backdrop, uh, can you talk about some of the ways the, the pandemic has been influencing your thinking about the future of job, uh, excuse me, job training uh, and jobs in the food service industry and economic mobility for both adults and youth? Yeah, sure. Great question. And you know, just adding on to what Marie was saying, we, you know, with the pandemic, we really saw, particularly with our um, students that we serve, individuals who have barriers to employment, who are disproportionately from community of color, that they are impacted more, even more greatly. And, and we saw that across the country, not just here in Seattle. And so when I think about, you know, where we go from here, where does, what's fair starts role in this, I think that what, um, what I'm seeing, us do internally and at the work that I do with Marie at Workforce Development Council is really, rather than it being centered around like, what are the jobs that are available? And that's important. Um, but how do we take this really human approach, which I think that Ali and the MOD team does just beautifully and say, what do our students want? Where do, where do the individuals who have overcome um, incredible diversity, including, you know, mental health crises, addiction, um, uh, homelessness, incarceration, what is it that they see for their lives? And I think that um, the restaurant industry and, and food service hospitality offers a really wonderful low barrier open door to create that job history, um, to learn a lot of those transferable skills. But like many people on this, uh, on this call who may have been involved in the restaurant industry, maybe when you were going to college or in high school as a first job, we need to th start thinking about how do we create an upward mobility pipeline so that we can help create the skill and not just create the skill, but support the connection to that next um, rung on the ladder in, in an individual's career. And how do we work as a community, both um, employer labor, uh, nonprofit community, and then at a greater scale with our government um, officials to put systems in place that allow employers to um, provide good supportive wage jobs and individuals to take those jobs without worrying that they are going to be in that benefits cliff gap. So um, not to get super wonky, but I will say, you know, you mentioned that $36 an hour. If you make that you need to be self-sufficient or um, Marie, you're going to know this off the top of your head better than I, the, the, a dollar amount in which you max out on the benefits cliff is what average twenty one dollars an hour, or is it lower? Around that, yeah. So, uh, so if you think about it, we've got employers who are in this really tough spot of mm -hmm. not being able to pay those higher wages above the twenty one dollars because of the economic model of their business. You've got employees who, if they work at that level or above, but less than the $36, lose their benefits. And so this is why you have people working two, three jobs. And this is a problem that we as a society have to solve. This is not something that can be solved just by the people on this call or in the sectors that we're talking about. So that's that's the way that we're really looking at, at Fair Start's work going forward is how can we take this holistic approach that includes partnership involvement, government advocacy, um, and then uh, those critical social su service supports that we offer to individuals who have barriers to employment. Excellent, excellent. It's like with all of us, I think the response to the pandemic causes us to reassess what our strategies are and how we can be responsive to the needs of the students and the people that we serve. And, and with um, that being said, Ali, we know that many people get their initial start in the food service industry. 
Um, and that Mod Pizza has a people first employment philosophy. And it's one of the reasons why Fair Start partners with Mod. So can you talk a little bit about what this philosophy means and how your company is uh, creating pathways towards economic mobility, particularly for young people? Mm -hmm. it's, such, um, it's such a big focus for us right now. And, and um, and it's such a complicated, uh, it's a complicated question and it's a complicated answer. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think I'll start by saying we are very much a work in process on uh, our thinking around all of this because um, the world has been changing so much. So if we go back um, uh, to kind of the, when, when our, our purpose um, and, and our, um, our, the developing out of our platform from which we make our positive impacts was really taking hold, um, it was in response to what we'd been observing, which was how when we were willing to open up our mind and our arms to people that had barriers and provide a great job opportunity, um, what they did with those opportunities were really astonishing to us. And that is how that inspired in us um, a desire to want to build our business to create more opportunities for that to happen. And what we saw happen, um, especially in the early days, um, was this incredible, you know, getting to gratitude um, for some of these individuals, and in in return, they they just poured themselves into their their job, and and Mod benefited hugely. You know, that the work ethic, uh, the customer service that was provided, um, just really quite incredible. And mm -hmm. and 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 so often um, we would see some great upward mobility with those individuals because they were just so incredible and and worked so hard and. So for a period of time, I think the focus was more about, well, our role is really to create an opportunity and to early on provide stability. And stability was more complicated. Uh, we had to learn you know, what that actually meant. And for some of our, um, um, the people that we were hiring, um, falling off of a stable place was something that could happen very easily and often. And it required us to get creative and think about how can we take care of the people once we've hired them. It's one thing to provide a job. It's another mm -hmm. thing to make sure that you are taking care of the people on their journey at, at, at their job. And so for us, we built out of what we call the Bridge Fund, which is a crisis um, fund that helps support um, members of the Mod Squad at, at a time of crisis. And, and it's been building out and developing um, quite beautifully over the years. And it does do a really good job of helping to um, secure a sense of stability. We then have, of course, we, we've had a lot of fun conversations with people like Angela around, well, what does the next chapter look like? And going from stability to mobility is another, you know, another process. And then the pandemic hits. And I think it kind of makes you, you know, that the timing of the pandemic was really not great for anybody, but certainly this, this process of going from stability to mobility, because as we've all just heard, um, the pandemic really knocked back a lot of progress, uh, people that had been getting perhaps to a place of stability. Um, but for us now, what we're realizing is in partnership with other organizations, we still need to always prioritize great opportunity creation, providing real opportunities that provide for that individual an opportunity to grow and thrive and develop and if that means that somebody is using MOD as a, as a step stone to something else, we encourage that. We think that is wonderful. Um, we have yet to figure out how do you measure that? How do you actually, how can that get measured externally as a success when somebody leaves your company? You know, that's a real issue. That's, that's, it's, it's positive turnover. It's a good thing. But we're, we're in the middle of working on how we do measure that because we want to encourage that. We, we get very excited when we're having conversations of network to next and how MOD can show up with other like-minded organizations and businesses to say, what is the best journey for this individual? And it might not be at MOD, um, but the fundamental opportunity that they are given to develop some of these skills um, to grow, that's, that's kind of our sweet spot and I think the next chapter will be one of really figuring out how we're, we, we can play a more active role in this, this mobility piece. Um, mm -hmm. That is, you know, again, we're kind of in the laboratory phase. We, we'll be working on that a lot in the next couple of months, um, refining our social impact strategy to make sure that the programs that we're involved with, our training materials, everything that we're doing is allowing for 
um, growth in this area, stability and then mobility. Um, yeah, and, and I, you know, one thing probably worth mentioning is for all of the negatives that um, we've experienced with the pandemic, um, you know, it is, we are also well aware of some of the silver linings and one is for sure that um, the service industry and being in service to others and being on the front line and helping um, is a really valued job. <laughs> and, and we need to keep that conversation going um, uh, and, and maybe go back to how it was you know, a long, long time ago when to be of service was a very noble undertaking. And, and we need to, I think, do a better job as a society and in our communities to really um, honor that. And, uh, and I think that's an opportunity going forward that I think the pandemic will hopefully help inform. Yeah, well said, well said, Ali. Thank you so much. You said a lot there that I kind of was um, connecting with, uh, not the least of which is the challenges of measuring social impact, right? It's like really how do you, um, measure that so that we can really uh, monitor how we're doing in terms of helping people to move from stability to mobility and being really intentional and very purposeful uh, in that regard as an employer. Um, I have a question for the group. Um, uh, so uh, any of you ladies can chime in on this one. Um, when you're thinking about uh, making progress in terms of reducing poverty and homelessness, right? These are these are big, meaty uh, topics and and complex areas. So we can't go at it alone. No, no one sector or area of uh, influence is going to tackle these problems. We really need to uh, partner. So when you think about the opportunity to partner, what types of partners partnerships within the workforce development area, do you feel are needed to meaningfully reduce poverty and homelessness? Don't be shy. <laughs> so I will, I will jump in and say, you know, while we are All right, workforce development, really, mm -hmm. workforce development always thinks about training, right? But it's not just training as Angela spoke to the benefits cliff and, you know, Ellie spoke to kind of the high cost. It's like, how do we look at the systems? The city of Seattle has invest a lot of money in human services and homeless services, but how do we not wait till people are in crisis, mm. but really think about, you know, bringing those. We know childcare right now, if the pandemic taught us anything, it's like childcare is a basic need for workers who are parents, right? And how do we actually make it so that we use those childcare dollars and they'll just cut them off when they might get to some stability or actually, you know, they earn less once they hit this part, but really use that to build people's economic, you know, stability and, and think about in, you know, even the homelessism, how do we start looking to prevent, not waiting until people are homeless, but looking at the housing costs, which are not directly tied to kind of workforce, but certainly, and it's not just going to be fixed by employers only, it's more of a regional approach. So I'm really looking at our community stakeholders said we are, it's like multi-system failure across systems that are impacting folks, right? So you cannot solve it or address it without connecting to all these systems. So childcare area, affordable housing, uh, forming partnerships with agencies whose mission is to provide those services mm -hmm. would help us to address yeah, yeah homelessness and um, reduce the poverty. Very good. Um, anyone else have thoughts around what we could do in terms of partnering uh, so that we are uh, collaborating and, and uh, fulfilling a, a mission, you know, by working together in this way? Any other can I provide a segue? I can provide a segue to Angela because I, I'd love for Angela to talk about this. Um, but, um, on the back of what Marie brought up, one of the things that we've learned and seen and experienced over the years is we're very interested and in, I think we do a pretty good job of, um, we, we really want to help solve a problem. And, and early on, the, the problem of people that have been previously incarcerated, not being able to get a job is a real problem. And mm -hmm. MOD has been very committed for years to help solve that problem and, and provide job opportunities for that population. We have 
over more recent years, started to ask the question, how do we become part of the solution to actually prevent people from becoming justice involved? That's where the challenge starts to get much greater and, and, and frankly, really interesting. And all things point to opportunity youth. And for us, the conversations, and Angela and I have had a, a lot of really fun ones um, around that. If, how can we begin to make a positive impact that really helps not just solve a problem, but prevents the problem from, you know, and I think it's kind of what, what you're saying, um, getting involved earlier and taking the lessons and the experiences that we've all had to say, what can we do earlier to now truly become focused on the solution? Um, that is where mod the work we've been doing with Fair Start for the last four years is inspired by that notion. And I know that that's an area that Angela is very focused on and, and it's much more of an expert in than I will ever be. But so I'd, it, I, I would love to hear Angela, you know, give her views on that. But the first thing that came to mind when Marie was talking about, yes, this is this is why we, we work with somebody like uh, Fair Start. Well, thank you, Ali, and thank you, Marie. I think that, you know, as Ali knows, I can talk about this for many hours. Um, so I won't, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of speak my thoughts on it quickly. I think, you know, when we did our last Food for Thought session, we talked about the great partnerships that Fair Start has engaged in with uh, respect to hunger relief. And, you know, really, I think that that was the theme that, that we've had over the last couple of years, not even in the pandemic, but, but pre-pandemic um, with, with partners like MOD. And I think that what is really critical is uh, aligning on values, making sure that we are aligning our own Fair Start values with the employer partners that we work with and really not going it alone. And I think that both what Marie touched on and Ali touched on, that is a, a, a real gap that we have just in, in, our, in our community and our society is supports that are seemingly intangible. And so if you, you know, I talk a lot when, when Ali and I talk, we talk a lot for lack of a better term of temporary supported employment. And that's essentially what we do with the mod interns who are going in for six um, to eight weeks into an internship program is offering some of that um, light case management um, that they might need helping the individuals identify their goals and working with the employer, in this case mod, to help understand and foster those but also help employers understand how to work with individuals who have barriers to employment and to work with individuals who have trauma. And I'll say that in the restaurant sector, it's not just people who have experienced homelessness or incarceration or addiction who have trauma. We all carry trauma. And I think that there are places and times when that can be triggered um, even more. Um, and I think that one of the things, whether it's restaurant manufacturing or, you know, the C-suite is when when you fail when you have that moment of failure and you don't have the skills to work past it because you were never either given those skills as a child or you have have experienced something in your life that sort of took you out of the society and put you in incarceration or you were in, um, experiencing homelessness. Those are not like it's not you don't just turn those back on. And so I think the thing that we provide at Fair Start that is so critical is that like personal connection to values, uh, connecting that to employment, um, and then you know really working so that it's a, a cohesive you know ecosystem that is pulled together supporting the employee, which then in turn benefits the employer. Um, I will say really quickly what one thing that we've learned um, at Fair Start that really benefits every single person, and this is so different than when Fair Start was founded 30 years ago. Every single person we talk to says, oh my gosh, I cannot believe how much the technical literacy and the technical training just in learning how to use Zoom and a computer and writing a resume has helped change my life. And I think that that's the thing that we all need to keep in mind as we move forward Customer service jobs are always going to be in demand because you know what, that mod pizza or that Starbucks that's in you know, the lobby of Children's Hospital, which I visit too often because I'm a mama voice, those employees who are working there are the perfect employees to go and work in the medical sector. And so we need to give them not only the 
behavioral you know, skills, the emotional skills, but also those tech um, resource skills as well. And I think that that's really where I see partnerships knitting it together because Fairstar can't do all of those things on our own, nor should we, right? Some of those things just are outside of our core competency. But if we can partner with, in, with different organizations, businesses like MOD, we can all bring our best expertise to the table and center again on that individual. And you know, it's, it is still, even though we're trying to create systemic change, it is one person at a time. That's exactly right. It is one person at a time. Thank you so much, Angela. Mm -hmm. You know, you, I get really excited about the time we live in, even though it's been hard, it's been hard on all of us, this pandemic. Um, but one of the things that I think that it has done is it's helped us to really assess our, our own core values, right? And you said this, Angela, that it, in terms of partnering, aligning around shared core values is really, really important. So we have this great opportunity. We have an opportunity to begin to look for those partners who share our values and to think innovatively about what we can do differently in the future. So with every crisis, we have opportunity. So this next question is for the group, and it has to do with what are some of the things that you're actually excited about in this post-pandemic era that we are moving into from a workforce development and employment perspective, because in many ways, we have an opportunity to be the change that we want to see. So again, don't be shy. Who would like to jump in and just share for uh, our listeners, what are some of the things that you're actually excited about when you think about the post-pandemic era we're moving into? Well, I want to let someone have the last word and not have it be me. We tend to go in these circles, and I'm last because I'm because I'm the fair start uh, spokesperson. But I'll go first on this one. Um, okay. You know, I think that my the thing that I'm most excited about in the future state is that we would have more and more people who would be in career jobs, whether that means that they have gone back and gotten their bachelor's mm -hmm. degree or beyond, whether that means that they got you know trained in, in technical. Um, whether that means that they became, a, you know, a, their own entrepreneur, um, a business owner in the food sector, whatever it is that their passion might be, that we have more people who can say, I needed some help in my life, and there was an organization like Fair Start or Fair Start who got me there to that, you know, to that, that place of stability, and that mm -hmm. there were people around me like employers at Mod Pizza, like you know, individual labor unions or um, college professors who helped continue individuals down the path to a point where, I mean, I'd love to say that Fair Start wouldn't exist someday because we would have this all figured out. And I'll credit Emily Diddy for you know really keeping that inspiration alive for me. But I think that really what what I look forward to in the future is taking everything that I love about the, the restaurant and food the hospitality sector, that's, that spirit of service that Ali talked about, and helping people find their path. And not because we said you should be trained in food service, but because they find a path that they're really passionate about. And if it's, if food service is one of their stops along the way, mm -hmm. I would be so proud that Fair Start was part of that. And if, if it's not, I'd still be proud for Fair Start to have some place in creating that, that stability for that individual. Yeah, well said. That is exciting. Marie, when you think about the future and um, the opportunities that this pandemic has presented, what do you get excited about? Yeah, I get excited about people's disruption causes us to step back, right, and, and really think about doing things in a different way. And it was, um, the, the pandemic was just so clearly, I think there was a, the racial reckoning again, but also people really started to see those disparities and inequities that are going on. Mm -hmm. And it gives us an opportunity to actually talk about race. And they actually recognize structural and systemic racism exists. Now, it's not a comfortable conversation that a lot of people like to have, but, you know, my approach is like, let's bring us to the table and have the conversation mm -hmm. and convene the different folks bringing community to the table to speak for themselves, co-design, you know, because programs alone aren't going to fix this. We need, I'd be remiss to say, we, we need some industry like champions, like Mod Pizza, that are really going to 
push and look at their, the way they're doing it and the opportunities to do things in a different way. I, coding camps aren't going to get us there. It's how do we collectively work to achieve some and have as our you know, North Star that's this equitable recovery. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Collaboration, partnership. Ali, would you like to weigh in on this before we go to our next question? Sure, and I very much echo what both Angela and Marie have said. Um, uh, I get most excited that in many ways, this horrible pandemic has um, been a great reboot in some important ways for our, for our planet. And the number one being that human connection matters and mm -hmm. that in spite of all the devastation that was going on in the last year plus, um, there were always um, moments of real hope and, yeah. uh, and inevitably those little moments of hope that we all saw on the news or that we heard about came down to one human being uh, helping another human being or just these simple acts of kindness. Um, at MOD, we, we, talk, we call them acts of modness, but little acts of kindness, little acts of modness that create that ripple effect um, that I think is really, can be incredibly impactful and can change the world. You know, it does, it, it goes that way and I think what we've all lived through this last year reminds us of what is most important, you know, and that is people and humans and the people that we're lucky enough to interact with. And the reminder that um, the small acts, uh, doing what you can with what you have, adds up to something quite wonderful. And so I get very excited that I think a lot of people are uh, reflecting on this idea that, wow, I've um, I get a chance to kind of have a bit of a reboot. I've reprioritized what I care about, how I spend my time, and I don't know how much time I have. So I want to use it wisely. Do you want to be part of a problem or part of a solution? Do you want to be part of a force for good or, or not? Uh, I think people have had enough time to ask those questions, and I hope that in years to come, we'll see the benefits of people saying, wow, I can be part of helping and it can start with just my neighbor, the person right across the counter from me. Um, and, uh, and I'm reminded that, you know, here we are on the other side of uh, what's been so difficult. Um, and there's a sweet little book I've been reading where it talks about, it asks the question, right, do you see the glass half full or the glass half empty? And the comment is, well, how about getting excited about the fact that there's a glass? And I think we're kind of at that stage right now where we, we're here, you know, and, and we have people who have incredible needs and there's a lot of struggle, but we have a lot of people who want to help and a lot of people who want to be part of something that matters and change lives. So I think the importance of connecting everybody um, is paramount. And um, again, comes right back to why we get so excited about meaningful partnerships where we know that we can actually um, you know, make a difference if we, if we are aligned with and working with and collaborating with the right people, so. Yeah, well said. Um, we've talked a lot about the partnerships that can happen at the provider level, the business community level. I like to now have the group uh, share your thoughts for our listeners about ways that our community can actually get involved and support the work that's being done to try to reduce poverty and eliminate uh, the homeless population uh, problems that we have in our community. What can we do as a community member to help support this work? Other than coming to Mod Pizza. <laughs> oh, I was about to say yeah, support Fair Start. I was going to say support Fair Start. I think supporting the organizations that are addressed, that are really the tip of the spear of dealing with these really important um, issues, Absolutely. finding those organizations that have the track record, have the expertise and have the passion and the commitment to, to really make change and um, finding those organizations and supporting them. Absolutely. And of course, Fair Start is definitely at the top of my personal list, considering that I am the board chair. So I'm a little biased on that <laughs> one. <laughs> But, you know, what are some other um, ways that you would motivate or encourage our community um, to get involved? Marie, what are your thoughts about that? I think it's really lazy. Like, we have been in this divisive kind of toxic 
kind of conversations for, you know, recently. And, and uh, I think it's now recognizing and really looking at kind of what are the root causes of some of this work. So instead of, you know, blaming and really being divisive, it's thinking about how we partner. I mean, people from the community, from our providers, it's really supporting them. And but listening, to, you're not coming at this with this charitable mode, but really as a partner, right? And um, and it's being more inclusive in just, you know, all of our kind of work. It's like expanding that table and really looking at the, listening to the different voices. Huge opportunities. There's great, great things happening. It's just how do we bring them all together and so that they really make a you know impact. Longer term. Absolutely. Absolutely. You said a powerful uh, word there, listening, <laughs> listening to each other. It's so powerful. You can uh, find common ground if you just take time to listen and to understand. All right. Um, Angela, I know uh, Fair Start is on the move. Um, what would you say in terms of how the community can get involved and support the work that we're doing? You know, I think that the thing that I've been really focused on lately from a community perspective, in addition to really um, adding on and agreeing with what Marie and Ali said, is how do we change this notion that we're giving to a charity and instead investing in a community? And so when I think about what Fair Start does, like I want to start thinking, you know, we all love to go to fun events and the gala, but you know, those really, I like those are fun things to, that we think about doing for, you know, the charity golf tournament. Like let's start having conversations about what it takes to invest in our community and start mm -hmm. investing in ways just as you would if you might have the capability of investing in your own personal um, wealth. And if we can do that at the community level, and if we, what we need to do though is understand who is doing the work, where to go, how to, how to make those investments. And I would say that, you know, shameless plug for Fair Start, if you're aligned with us, that, that really transforming poverty starts with those farthest from justice, uh, those farthest mm -hmm. from access, then, then, then I would love for that to be the investment. Um, possibly slightly controversial if you're invest if you're giving to fair start because you'd be really excited to see uh, a fair start graduate in your favorite restaurant which is not a bad thing we want that you know as well that may not be the best motivation and so really changing your thinking about why you're investing in the community why you're investing in in programs and organizations like um like fair start like the other workforce um employment social enterprises that exist in our region and around the country and then I think this last thing that I would that I would encourage people to do is so hard because we always say contact your local representative. And I understand how nebulous this seems. And when we start talking about the federal government, how it, you know, it, it really does feel like our one voice or our even small collective voices won't be enough to make change in, in DC. But I'll tell you, we have an amazing set of federal delegates who are really working. And when you want to talk about something that is not partisan, you talk about jobs because yeah. everyone supports individuals getting into successful jobs that are appropriate for um, their skill level, their age in life, their time in life. And we need our federal delegation to start talking about things like this, like the benefits cliff, you know, what happens, how, how we are calculating poverty in a region like Seattle should not be the same as in rural Mississippi. And we have one federal calculation. Like mm -hmm. That does not work. And that won't start changing until more of us start talking about it. And so um, mm -hmm. if there's one wish that I would have is that people would reach out and just simply let them know, I care about this. Like mm -hmm. I care about people being able to live sustainably in my region. And I think that that could go a long ways and people don't realize it, but that's, that, I would leave you with that. Absolutely. Well, well, well said. This has just been a rich conversation. Each of you, I just want to thank you for your time in um, sharing your heart and um, uh, giving us some insights into what you're thinking 
uh, about how we can really uh, work towards equitable employment. Um, before we begin to wrap things up, I just want to give each of you, uh, Marie, Ali, um, uh, Angela, an opportunity, if, if there's anything you wanted to share that you didn't get a chance to share uh, before we begin to wrap up, I, I want to give you that opportunity to do that with our listening audience. Uh, so is there anything that someone would like to share that you didn't get a chance to share before we begin to wrap up for today? Okay, so you guys have poured your heart out and we do thank you for that. Um, okay, we don't want our phone ringing. Um, thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. Again, we have a, a challenge in front of us and that is to achieve equitable em uh, employment. It's a critical part of building a thriving and inclusive economy that's gonna benefit all employers, workers, and our community. It's really what um, life is all about, is helping us to um, help each other to live the best and fullest uh, expression of ourselves and work is a way to do that. Um, I look forward to seeing how we can continue to do this work together. Uh, each of these organizations have something to teach us, even as we are uh, locking elbows together and, and learning along the way. Like we said before, um, this is a, a new uncharted territory. Nobody has all the answers, but together we can come up with solutions that are really going to move the needle on poverty and homelessness. And so I'm looking forward to seeing how we are going to work together in that regard. And I encourage all of you who have uh, taken time out of your day to uh, be with us to support these organizations. And you can do so by going to their websites, finding out what we're about, uh, absolutely, uh, maybe checking out uh, my pizza, uh, and you know, just really showing up and being present and being the change that we want to see in the world. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. you ladies rock, okay? So no hey, more. I, I do have to just give one little <laughs> plug uh yes. we dine at mod pizza every thursday evening we grab it from the ballard location so if you're all in ballard on a thursday night chances are you will see uh you'll see us there because it's it's all our favorite dine out and my seven-year-old is a solid solid pepperoni <laughs> fan and the moon pie <laughs> or no name pies awesome, awesome we are very awesome. grateful yeah, thank you. thank you guys so much. Thank you to all of our participants. Thank you very much. Uh, you guys enjoy the rest thank of you. your day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.